Hello everybody. Hello YouTube. Hello art history enthusiasts and visual culture aficionados. It's me again, Miss M, and I'm back with yet another video. Uh, today, unfortunately, it's not going to be a shining video, but hopefully tomorrow we will get back on the shining um, bandwagon. I don't know. Uh, I've been working very hard doing screenshots. I've got a bunch of them. And I need to put them all in a PowerPoint presentation. And then, like, just switch on the thing and do my video and narrate it and, you know, walk through all of the, all of the slides and everything that I got ready. That, hopefully, if everything goes according to plan, I'll be doing that tomorrow. Um, today, I'm doing something a little different. I'm trying a little experiment. Hopefully everything's going to go okay. But um, today, I just want to sort of try something new. I want to try something new. And I've, I've spent the last couple of hours working on the Shining video. And I said, yeah, I'm not going to be able to do that tonight. But I can do this. I can try and do this. Um, but before, like, you know, I get into what I'm here to do today, uh, what are we going to do today? Um, let me just go ahead and get through the church announcements. I want to welcome any and all of you back, uh, to the channel. This is the channel. You're in the right place. The object of art. And I've got 276 subscribers. Thank you. Every single last one of you. I appreciate it so much. Of course, the goal is to get to a thousand and get monetized and the whole thing, but whenever that happens, if it happens, it doesn't matter. I'm having a blast doing these. And I want to say, returning viewers, thank you for returning. New viewers, thank you for being new. Subscribers, thank you for subscribing. And all of you, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and share the video if you know somebody, anybody, who might enjoy this particular brand of nonsense. Um, I'm making so many videos, or I'm trying to make like a video every day, at least for the first month of the year. It's kind of part of my own personal New Year's resolution. I've got a couple of them this year, so let's hope I can continue doing this every day, churning out a new video every day. God help me. Um, and I wanted to try something a little bit new. I'm taking a little bit of a risk. I, I'm trying to kind of push myself to do new stuff and force myself to come up with new topic ideas and I, you know, just conversation starters and discussion starters or whatever as far as my videos go. And I decided to go ahead and try the reaction video thing. And today I'm going to try to react to this video. Um, you can't see it yet, but I'll, I'll switch it on in a minute. This is a famous video from the world of, I think, art history. It's from 60 Minutes. It's from 1993. Morley Safer's infamous 1993 art story, uh, September 19th, 1993. So this video is approximately 30 years old, and I think the title of it is, uh, Yes, But Is It Art? Okay, and here's the description. Not much of a description, but there it is. Uh, Morley questions Jeff Koons, Jeffrey Deitch, and Hilton Kramer about contemporary art and whether it means anything at all. Um, this video is shown, you know, whether, whether you know it or not, whether you like it or not, in art history courses, probably like all over America. Um, and that's where I, that's where I saw it for the first time. So, like when I said I'm taking a bit of a chance doing this, I mean copyright strikes. Um, so CBS, please don't come for me. 60 Minutes, please don't come for me. Uh, this is for educational purposes only. Well, education and I hope people do enjoy watching this video. So I guess entertainment too. Um, but I'm not trying to pilfer anything. I'm not trying to steal anything. I'm not trying to pass off. 60 Minutes or CBS's or Morley Safer's work as my own. Obviously not. I'm reacting to this. I'm adding my input. And, you know, I'm trying to do that in video form. So, 
hopefully the YouTube gods or the algorithm gods or whatever will be with me. Pazuzu, I could use your help too if you're, if you're around. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I'm going to try and react to this. It's about, it, it's exactly a 12 minute video. Uh, I'm going to let it run and then I'll pause and say whatever it is that I want to say, whatever I have to say about it. And I guess we'll just go from there. Um, once again, you know, I, I just got done with the church announcements. Um, and I just want to remind you, if you're here for The Shining, it's okay. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. God help me tomorrow. Pazuzu help me tomorrow. Uh, I'll get through with that. So, uh, but today we're doing this. And this is a very famous video. Like I said, it's shown in art history courses, especially modern art, postmodern art, you know, anything, anything to do with art or an art history course, um, where they discuss 20th century art, but especially, you know, the later part or of the 20th century, maybe the last quarter or so, maybe the 1960s onward of the 20th century with regard to art. And this thing was made in 1993. So like I said, about 30 years ago, not quite 30 years ago because September, but, um, you know, maybe 29 years and three months ago, but it's still as relevant as ever. And whatever, you know, it is that Morley Safer was trying to do in this uh, video essay, um, in 1993, 30 years ago, it's still meaningful. It's still significant. It's still something that needs to be discussed. It hasn't been thoroughly discussed, in my opinion. Nothing that I've seen anyway. People, you know, show this or they, they remark about this. They talk about this uh, video from 1993, but they don't say much. They really don't, in my opinion. I don't know if I'm going to say much. I don't know if I can add to anything that Morley did, probably not, but I'm going to try in my own little way. And I want to do a follow-up to his follow-up down here, as you can see. And this is, I've marked this. I'm going to do this at another time, even in tough times. Contemporary art sells. And this is Morley Safer's follow-up to this video from 1993. Yes, but is it art? Um, you know, we're going to see what's going on. We're going to see what's going on with this here. And, you know, what, I don't know what questions we should ask. Was Morley right? And, I mean, maybe the first question is, what is Morley trying to say? Okay, what exactly is Morley trying to say? And whatever he's trying to say, is he right? Was he right? Um, was he wrong? I don't know. So let me just try this again. And, and <laughs> disclaimer, I'm just still figuring out how to use this equipment. So I hope the audio takes the audio from the video here. That That's what I mean. So please bear with me. I tried and I tried and I tried. Let's hope it goes well. So let me, let me, um, let me kick this into gear. So here we go. 60 minutes. Rewind. It may have escaped your notice, but recently a vacuum cleaner just like this one and the one down in your basement was sold for $100,000. Also, a sink went for $121,000 and a pair of urinals for $140,000. All of the above and even more unlikely stuff is art. That's what the artists say, the dealers, and of course, the people who lay out good money. It all may make you believe in the wisdom of P.T. Barnum that there's a sucker born every minute. Okay. I know he just barely got started, but he's already invoking P.T. Barnum. He says, it says right here in the, in the closed captioning, there's a sucker born every minute. He listed the prices of the various items he listed the vacuum cleaner, the sink, the urinal. Big money, at least in 1993. In today's world with inflation and what have you, maybe it's not such big money, but it's still, like, that's still a lot of money. 
And the, please don't forget that these items that he's talking about, the vacuum cleaner, the urinals, the sink, whatever, have just grown in value, monetary value. So let's keep it going. The noble auction house of Sotheby's in New York last November. The long anticipated winter sale of contemporary art. And here it is, folks. Got 242, the Gerhard Richter. Please note that the measurements for this work are reversed. It's actually a horizontal painting. I'm sorry, it's actually a vertical painting. 78 by 59 inches. And we start here at $50,000 this bid for this now. And we start here at $10,000 this bid for this now. $10,000. Down it goes then at one million eight hundred thousand nine. At one million nine. I have one million nine hundred thousand. Now say two million. This one, a canvas of scroll. Okay, so with this little bit of footage here, you get to see the, you know, the rarefied world of high-priced art auctions. That's what Marley wants you to see. He, I guess he wants you to see how pretentious it is and how ridiculous it is. And, you know, these people, they think, I think quite highly of themselves, uh, the auctioneers and the people in the audience and the artists and the art dealers and all of the people involved in this. Um, you know, this is, this is meant to, I believe, in my opinion, uh, I believe that we're being shown this by Morley because he is trying to infuriate you. Okay, let's keep it moving. Done with the wrong end of a paintbrush bears the imaginative title of Untitled. It's by Cy Twombly and was sold for $2,145,000. And that's dollars, not Twombly's. And uh, 20000 Ooh, what the hell did he just say? Did you hear that? Or read that here in the captioning. That's dollars, not Twombly's. He, I believe, you know, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but I believe that Morley is trying to say something without saying it out loud. He's trying to say something without saying it in open, plain language. <sighs> what could he possibly mean? by saying, oh no, that's not dollars. Uh, I'm sorry, that's, oh, excuse me, excuse me. That's dollars, not Twombly's. Is he saying that these artworks are being used as a form of currency? Or a substitute for the recognized currencies? Whether it's a U.S. dollar or the Deutschmark or whatever, right? And if that's what he's saying, what are the implications of that? Let's keep it moving. Start this now at $20,000. There were bargains. Rat, repeated three times, reached 30000 Sold at 30000 yours, sir? And green grass, the words, not the plant, went for 13000 So. And seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars for it. I have the auction itself was a glittering affair. A bank of phones connected Paris, Geneva, Frankfurt, and London. Among the hottest items, lot number seventy-two. This is sold from the catalog. Jeff Koons' inspired work: three basketballs submerged in a fish tank. Sold at one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, giving new meaning to slam dunk. Wow, Dr. J. Oh, good heavens. Here comes Jeff Koontz. Now, Jeff Koontz, th this is the time when Jeff Koontz, I don't know if you could have called him an emerging artist at this time, because I need to do some research that I haven't done to prepare for this. I know a little bit about Jeff Koontz's art. At these basketballs, like, that are suspended in this fish tank, I guess. Um, <laughs> those, they're pretty famous at this point, as are his vacuum cleaners and all kinds of other things. Um, I might do a video specifically about Jeff Koontz. We shall see. Um, I want to do a video about Jeff Koontz. I want to do a video about Jonathan Meese. I want to do a video about Salvador Dali. I want to do like a bunch of videos, but there's a reason Morley chose Jeff Koontz. And not just because he was like, you know, the it boy of the day in 1993. He was young and hip and whatever, as far as the art world is concerned. Um, but 
be, there's something going on. Marley chose Jeff Koontz for a reason. Um, and I'll get into it when I do a video about it, but just, just watch him in this video. Watch him talk about his freaking whatever, whatever he's trying to explain to Marley. Check it out. And back in his New York studio, Jeff Koons has more where that came from and a slightly shaky version of what it all means. This is an ultimate state of being. I, I want, wanted to uh, play with people's desires, that they desired disequilibrium, they desired pre-birth. What did he say? The language is... Okay. Now, Marley is having probably a very similar reaction that you are. At listening to Jeff Koons's ridiculousness, um, it's not making much sense, is he? Jeff Koons isn't making a much, making much sense. I don't think he's trying to make sense. I really don't. Jeff Koons, he's not. A, I mean, he's not a good artist at all. And I'll get into that when I do my video about him. But you know what he is good at? He's a terrific salesman. Real good at that. And Morley just looks underwhelmed <laughs> and completely like he, he, he's thinking about what he's going to have for lunch or something. Not at all listening to, <laughs> to Jeff Koontz. And he has like, he has, Morley has his narration just cut Jeff off. Um, because he's just not here for it. Let's keep it moving. Speak. The same pitch that convinced the emperor to buy new clothes or waterlogged basketballs. I was giving it. Okay. He's comparing. Specifically here, Jeff Koontz's art to the fairy tale by Hans Christian Andersen, The Emperor's New Clothes. And The Emperor's New Clothes, if you don't know about it, if you've never heard about it, um, that story, it's a children's story. Basically, a couple of, like, charlatans sell the titular emperor some new clothes, but it's not really clothes. They just convince the emperor that they're making him some new clothes, beautiful clothes, and they're not making anything at all. And they pretend to dress him. And the emperor, you know, walks down the street in a parade and he is just butterball naked. And nobody says anything because it's the emperor. Nobody wants to offend the emperor. But somehow they, these two, again, highwaymen, have convince the emperor that he is in fact wearing clothes that they have made for him and it takes a child to point out that the emperor is naked and nobody else everybody else can see it you know but nobody else says anything for fear i, I guess of being put to death or whatever so he's comparing this what we're looking at here jeff coons his basketballs whatever and just in general the art that we're seeing in this kind of auction He's comparing that to the emperor's new clothes. Let's keep it moving. Definition of uh, life and death. This is the eternal. This is what life is like uh, also after death. Aspects of the eternal. Jeff Koons is a genuine phenomenon. Still in his 30s, he's become a millionaire since he moved from commodity brokering on Wall Street to art mongering to the world. Did you hear that? So Jeff's former career what says right here commodity brokering on wall street and he's he's moved over to what morley calls an art mongering career you know what else what else is another thing that is mongered fish right um fishmonger that's that's kind of a pretty common word so somebody who's just selling things um i think the word monger if i mean i'm not going to look it up right now but the general idea of the word monger, to monger something, or a mongerer, is somebody who sells things that are pretty cheap, and he sell, he or she um, sells them, like, at a fish market. You know, you don't think of a fish market as a classy place. I mean, they call them fish wives for a reason. They're loud, they're, they're brash, they're uncouth. <laughs> so the fishmonger and his wife, the fishwife, um... You know, it's not really the kind of place that you would associate with purchasing things for hundreds and thousands or, in today's world, millions of dollars. No, no, no. So Morley is being shady as hell. He's <laughs> he's throwing all kinds of shade 
at Jeff, at all these other artists, at these auctions, at modern or postmodern art. Ooh, Lord. So let's keep it moving. He doesn't actually paint or sculpt. He commissions craftsmen to do that. Or he goes shopping for basketballs and vacuum cleaners. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, did you hear that? Or read that? Jeff doesn't do any of it. That's why I said he's not a good artist, because he's he doesn't do any of the art himself. He outsources it like a really good businessman, a really good salesman. Anyway, let's keep it moving. These vacuum cleaners, though. Oh, Lord. Makes them art, Jeff. I always like the anthropomorphic quality. Uh, they're like lungs. So this object now is just free to eternally just to display its newness, its integrity of birth. Okay. He just asked Jeff, what makes it art? And he just, Jeff just, oh. Yeah, that was a bunch of bullshit. Let's keep it moving. What do you say to the man who <clears throat> said, fool, you went and paid $100,000. I just got a genuine Coons for 80 bucks. This work would be a, a signed uh, work by myself or would have a letter of authenticity. Okay, did you hear that too? Morley asks him, okay, what makes it art? And then he answers and then Morley says, well, you know, why would anybody spend a hundred thousand dollars on this one if if it's the vacuum cleaner when they could just go to the store and buy a vacuum cleaner and then try to pass it off to the untrained eye i guess as a genuine jeff koontz and jeff koontz he says well i have a letter of authenticity think about that for a little while think about that for a little while I don't know whether or not Morley realizes what he's doing, but he's unraveling not just the modern art world or the the world of mo um, modern or postmodern art auctions. He's unraveling art, period. I don't know whether or not Morley's that was Morley's intent. I really don't. But maybe he just wanted to poke fun at modern art, postmodern art, contemporary art, but he wanted to leave the old stuff alone from maybe, you know, the 1900s, not the 1900s, the 1800s and and backwards. He, he maybe thinks that that art met, was good or meaningful or whatever, but this new stuff, oh no, it's just trash. I think Morley doesn't realize, like, how well he did with this video essay. But let's keep it moving. He's already had a retrospective at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. Do you think he's making fun of everyone? Do you think he's making fun of the art world? No. No, he's making his money off the art world. I'm, I'm not one saying to uh, to so bring these closer. I'm saying we need here and we still don't up. have this we need here. It up. We need out. For his pièce de résistance last year, he hired platoons of German workmen to erect a 40-foot puppy made of flowers. And the art world cheered. I'm wired to crave unique food? Excuse me about that, that damn ad. I, I'm sorry about that. But, um, I paused it. <laughs> I just, I paused it and then I, I picked it right back up. So anyway, we're talking about the puppy now. Look at this damn thing. And look at him. And look at this, like, real life puppy. What the hell is going on? What in the blue fuck is going on here? First we got those vacuum cleaners and the basketballs and and now this enormous topiary puppy. Okay, let's keep it moving. Mm. It's very much about something extremely banal made into uh, something terrifically heroic. Okay, this guy, whoever he is, he's talking about a concept that um, is discussed quite readily and quite uh, frequently and especially in the realm of postmodern art and the way it's just written about the language used to talk about it and the way it's taught in schools in doesn't matter where you're taking an art history class if you're gonna learn about postmodern art you're gonna learn about the concept of banal versus fantastic and fantastic versus banal and that's what this guy's talking about 
it's like these people who are the purveyors of culture in the art world, the art history world, the world of auctions, whatever, the art market, and in all of these other areas of, of thought and learning and study and whatever, there's like, there, there seems to be some kind of committee and they seem to have a meeting. I don't know how often they have it, but they have it. And they decide on what language to use, what philosophers work to use to allegedly explain whatever kind of art you're dealing with. And that's the last word on the matter. And if you, whoever you are, doesn't really matter who you are, but if you want to challenge that and say, wait a minute, there's a different way of looking at this. We don't, it doesn't have to be banal versus fantastic. Like we can think of something else, can't we? Or they can be another perspective, another opinion. These purveyors of culture will not let you do that in their own special way. And they, the, the discourse is dominated by individuals who have a very, um, large stake in making sure that the language that has been chosen or the concepts or the ideas or whatever that has been chosen uh, for talking about whatever it is that's being talked about, that that doesn't ever change. If it sounds familiar, it should. Let me keep it moving. And important. And uh, so it kind of bespeaks of our own sense of ego at certain moments in our life. Of course. Ego. Ego. Really? You mean like the kind of ego one would have to have to spend, I don't know how much of an obscene amount of money on some bullshit at an art auction? You mean that kind of ego? Oh, sir, I, I suggest you remain seated. Okay, let's keep it going. Most of this art of the 90s would be worthless junk without the hype of the dealers and even more important, the approval of the critics. Hmm. They write in language that to this viewer anyway sounds important but might as well be in Sanskrit of the American artist Julian Schnabel okay so Marley said a version of what I just said but <sighs> Marley left out one important very important um, institution there he said what did he say art auctions and what have you but he did say he didn't say education he didn't say universities, he didn't say schools, he didn't say colleges, they're part of it too. And the people who work there, the professors and whatever, they're part of it too. There is no room for alternative thought in that world. I can't say for every other like area of learning or study, but definitely for art history, no, you can't go against the grain. And if you do, trust me, they, they, you, you, is they've basically made it impossible for anybody to have an original thought or an idea and get it published and get it like looked at and thought about or discussed openly mm -mm, no so he said it might as well be in sanskrit arts i think he calls it art speak it might as well be in sanskrit why did he choose sanskrit i mean morally morally i'm talking about here why did he choose the word sanskrit to just you know to, to compare to art speak. Ah, oh. does I mean does he did he did Morley make that choice consciously? I guess he did because he wrote this. But like, how consciously did he make that choice? He could have said any other language. Sanskrit happens to be an ancient language that like nobody speaks anymore, or writes in anymore. But like, what's going on? I won't like think about that too too deeply. But let's keep it moving. A critic wrote. His is an eschatological art appropriating the master meanings of life and the master languages of art to reassert the sense of hurt and loss that evades both. A book on Christopher Wool, the rat, rat, rat man, said of his work, They communicate not like facile appropriations, but as a honed perfectionist idea of that discourse reduced to the irreducible, then starting all over again. Arts Magazine said of Robert, so if you try to take an art history class, you're going to like run into a situation where they're going to expect a term paper out of you. And 
the te the professor is going to expect you to write something and you're going to have to go to the library or now i guess you know more contemporarily the internet or whatever and you're going to have to find resource material to you know cuz that's what you do when you write a term paper you need a bibliography you need to cite your sources yes you do and this is the kind of stuff you're going to run into and you know again we're focusing here on contemporary art it doesn't matter it doesn't matter even if it's old art ancient art renaissance art baroque neoclassical re renaissance what i already said renaissance impressionism don't matter you're going to run into this kind of dense ass language that just looks like that person who wrote it is just lost in their own head and somehow that got through somehow they published that it doesn't make any goddamn sense and it doesn't have to i guess that's the point right but just letting you know letting you know if you if you want to read about this which is fun it is fun to look at these books and just like go through a paragraph or whatever but let's keep it moving gober who specializes in arms legs sinks and urinals installations function as utopian and dystopian spaces the tableau arrests and its own stillness suspends social time and if you're still stumped let Jeffrey Deitch, critic, dealer, and fan, explain. This work in particular shows something of the uncertainty in which artists find themselves today in the human sphere. They don't quite know exactly where they stand. So simple when you think about it. As simple as one of Mr. Gober's urinals. A major New York art collector, Elaine Danheiser, has three all in a row. They look like urinals, but they really aren't. Well, I know, because there's no plumbing attached yes. to them. But <clears throat> beyond that, does it comment on society in some way, do you think? I think it comments on things that we take for granted and that we really don't see. Uh, that is uh, Robert Ryman. And that is, it's a, a, a white rectangle. Right. And um, Ryman has reduced painting to its very essence. And uh, <clears throat> a lot of people don't understand that, but... I confess I have a them <laughs> on this one. <laughs> well, some of his work has a little more texture in it. This one is a little flatter because he really has reduced it. Uh, he's a minimal artist. And... Uh, I would say so. <laughs> I think that this exchange between Morley and this lady, Elaine Danheis, I think it speaks for itself. I don't think I need to explain anything about that. You can hear them. You can see what's going on. Ooh. The shade of it all. <laughs> Let me just keep it moving. Now this intrigues me. Yes, this is a young artist by the name of Felix Gonzalez Torres. May I touch it? You can, as a matter of fact, you're allowed, they're candies, they're Italian candies, and one is allowed to, to take, take them. But one would reduce the value of the Well, payment. then you just replace them. I see. Yes. In my... What the hell? A pile of candy in a corner is art. Or, you know, the title of this piece by Morley is called Yes, But Is It Art? <sighs> yes, but that's the question Morley's trying to answer. A pile of candy in the corner, those urinals that are not attached to any plane. By the way, that that's that just a, sort of a redo of Marcel Duchamp, but I can talk about him in another video, too. Um, what's going on? And, you know, if you take a candy, I think they're Perugina candies. Um, and if you take them, that's okay. You know, if you eat them all, you can, it doesn't reduce the value of the art. You just replace them with more, I guess, Perugina candies. They're pretty re readily available. Even if you can't find them at the store, you can go, you know, maybe or order them on Amazon or whatever. So the value of the art is not, are you, are you getting this? Are you catching this? The value of the art is not the um, intrinsic value of the object itself or the materials that went into making it new no. the value what these people what these these rich people are paying for 
at these auctions is not the item itself or the materials that it's made of. No, they're, they're paying for an idea. I'll say that again. They're not paying for the art object itself, the object itself, the materials it's made of. No. Or, or the artist's work even. No. The art, they're not paying for the artist's labor, like, especially in the case of somebody like Jeff Koontz. No, no, no. Jeff Koontz doesn't do his own art. He has other people do it for him. He puts his name on it. You don't know who did it. You don't know who that craftsperson is or that artisan or artist. No. All you know is Jeff Koontz. Um, you're not paying for the object. You're not paying for the materials. You're not paying for the artist's labor. You're paying for the idea. If you're going to go ahead and buy one of these. That's what's going on. Now let's keep it moving. Let's keep it moving. Art critic Hilton Kramer says the people who buy this stuff are victims of a trashy hoax. Just the act of spending that money on an object makes them feel that they are collaborating in creating the art history of their time. But is it also a case of the emperor's clothes? Oh, it's largely a case of the emperor's clothes, but they don't see it that way. Okay, he's invoked the emperor's clothes again. This this gentleman here on screen, Hilton Kramer, he thinks that these rich people have been swindled by these art world charlatans. That it's a it's a huge hoax, and they you know they paying all that money for the art. That's why they do it. This is what Hilton Kramer is saying. They this is why they do it because it makes them feel good about themselves. They feel like they're contributing something uh, by paying all that money for this stuff. Hilton, sir, I think he missed the mark. I think Hilton Kramer missed the mark. Or, or, is there something that neither Hilton, nor Morley, nor Elaine, nor Jeff, nor any of the auctioneers, or any, is there something that they are just, that they just can't say out loud? Something's going on here. And they're all dancing around it. I mean, they're, or they're trying as, in my opinion, Morley too, are, they're all trying as, as hard as they can to get as far away as possible from what is really going on. If you've seen some of my other videos, you might have an idea of what I think is going on. I won't say it. I don't think I'll say it. I don't know if I'll say it in this video, but yeah, they're not really talking about the elephant in the room. They're doing everything they can not to talk about it. Let's keep it moving. When I look at all this... Oh, this guy's a hoot. Hold on. Let, let, let Enjoy this. Enjoy this guy. All contemporary art. I see nothing. Nothing. Brian Sewell, a London critic, is appalled. No other word for it. Imagine the outrage of a man steeped in the work of the masters when he witnessed, at an auction, the sale of a can of excrement, the work and waste of the artist Piero Manzoni. I suppose you could argue that he was making, as it were, a symbolic statement that all contemporary art is feces. There was a, a painting, if that's the word, at the Sotheby's sale by a man named Wool, Chris Wool, I think, and it was the word rat repeated three times. Mm. Art? Oh, I think you were lucky to have the word. And you might just have had a blank canvas. That's pretty commonplace now. Mm-hmm. I might do... I mean, I'm having so many ideas. I want to do a video about Jeff Koontz. I want to do a video about Jonathan Meese. I want to do... I want to do a video about Piero Manzoni and the, and the can of shit. I sure do. I sure do. That would be a hoot. Um, but this, this guy that Morley just talked to, Brian Sewell, um, he used to pal around with Salvador Dali. So, you know, he's steeped in the masters. You know, that's real art, according to Morley. And I guess according to Brian Sewell. <sighs> Don't quite know what to think. Hmm. Is it though? What's going on? What's going on? S something in the buttermilk ain't clean. It just ain't. They're not saying it. They're never going to say it. They're never going to say what's really going on. They're not. 
the can of shit, you know, merda de artista, that like, mm -mm. you know, that's a statement. But no, 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 Brian Sewell is seeped in the masters. So what? So what? No. See, they're, they're trying to denigrate one form of art, one form of foolery, fakery, fuckery, and laud another form of the same thing. Just because it's pretty doesn't mean it ain't shit. Okay. Or what, should I, should I rephrase that? <laughs> I don't know. But I think you know what I mean. Let's keep it moving. It's a, a standard assumption in the art world today that a work of art is anything an artist says it is. And an artist is somebody who calls himself an artist and there are no other tests. No. He's wrong. I think that's Hilton Kramer talking. Um, no. A work of art is not anything the artist says it is. And an artist is not just somebody who decided to call him or herself that. Um, and there are no other tests. No. The tests are <laughs> the thing that these people refuse to talk about. That's what the tests are. I'm get I'm getting heated. I don't know. Why won't they talk about it? Why won't they talk about, like, no, it's not just anything the artist says it is. It's not, you know, an artist isn't just somebody who says that they're an artist. No, it's what this world of auctions and the art market and galleries and whatever, it's what those people or that those entities, whatever, will accept into their folds. And if they choose somebody, doesn't matter who it is, whether it's Salvador Dali, whether it's Jeff Koons, or, you know, somebody like Banksy, or, oh, what's the other one, Damien Hirst, Tracy Eman, whoever. Why were these people accepted into this? Nobody ever talks about that. They're pe these people, these artists, and their art are there for a reason. And we're qu very quickly finding out it's not necessarily because they're good. Whatever that means, whatever good means. They're, they're not necessarily quote unquote good at creating quote unquote art. Again, whatever the word art means. Do we know what that word means? Do we, are we sure we know what that word means? Are we sure we, are we, <laughs> are we sure we're sure we know what that word art means? I might have done a video about it. Maybe like early, early on, like last year in February when I started this channel. I think I might have done a video, video about it. I'm not sure, but I think I discussed that at least somewhat. I'll try to like track it down and like maybe pop it into a community post or something. But what the hell does that word mean? Art. What the hell does that word mean? Good. What is going on? What's going on? Nobody wants to talk about it. I guess it's a secret, eh? And you and me, we're not allowed to know. Let's keep it moving. I don't understand it one scrap. <laughs> I don't understand it at all. Well, let's go Well, we don't belong to this generation. <laughs> we must retire. The dealers lust after the hypable. And a few years ago, they struck pure gold when Jean-Michel Basquiat came on the scene. Lord Jesus. Now, I've done a couple of Basquiat videos indirectly because of the Orlando Museum, debacle, caper, whatever you want to call it. And now, at this point, I think in 1993, he was already, he had already passed on. But Morley is talking about that. There are, like I said, in another one of my videos, can't remember which one, I've made quite a few um, in the past 11 months. I think 90 or so I've made in the past 11 months. And I'm not monetized, so I, I did all that for free. <laughs> Y'all help me out. Help, help, help get me subscribers. But the thing about there are certain artists 
whose art just seems to pop up again and again and again and again and again and again and again in all of these art world, art market, money laundering schemes that thankfully the FBI has got their eye on, at least, at least, you know, the really egregious ones. Um, why? Why Jean-Michel Basquiat? Why Banksy? Why? What's going on? What the hell's going on? They don't want to talk about that now, do they? Let's keep it moving. His work, giant, childishly wrought graffiti, sent the art world into spasm. Jean-Michel was heaven sent for hype. The story was that this poor black kid was discovered on the street by Andy Warhol. The fact was he came from an upper middle class suburban family and had a keen eye for the marketplace. But the legend stuck and his work started selling for as much as a quarter of a million dollars per graffito. Then in 1988, when his popularity was declining, his career was saved. He died of a drug overdose. And now that there would be no more Basquiat's, the market fell in love with him all over again. He was officially declared genius last fall, when the Whitney Museum in New York honored him with a retrospective. You think you could do? <sighs> that sounds awfully cold-hearted. What Morley just said, you know, he's saying the best thing that could have happened to this guy's career, Jean-Michel Basquiat's career, he says the best thing that could have happened is, to his career is, you know, that he died. That is cold-blooded. Um, but at the same time, once again, maybe Morley cannot say it out loud. Morley has bosses. Morley is part of the establishment, let's just face it, or he was. Um, and he probably knows exactly what's going on. He probably knows that there's plenty of crime and criminal activity done with or associated with art and the art market. But nobody can say that out loud. This is a colossal sham. So there, that's the part. I said the quiet part out loud right now, just there. Okay, and Morley? Morley can't do that. Morley has sponsors. Let's keep it moving. As well? Yeah. You, you could do that? You yeah. Could do that. better than that. You could? Yeah. yeah. But that looks like what? Some eggs? Eggs? eggs. eggs. Yeah. Could you draw a better egg than that? Yeah. yeah. I could draw even a yellow. It was packed with people, and it resounded with art speak. Okay, those kids were just adorable. They, you know... Why did Morley do that? He's re-emphasizing, without saying it again, he didn't say the Emperor's new clothes again. No, he just brought some kids that said they could do better than the Jean-Michel Basquiat paintings at this exhibit. Because, like I said, in the, in the Emperor's new clothes, if you've never heard of the story, it's a little child who has no fear. Everybody else is afraid of the Emperor and, like, what's saying... You know, if they, if they point out that the emperor is naked, they're afraid of the repercussions or the punishment. But the little kid, he's like, no, no, are, are you all, like, w what's wrong with you guys? Can't you see he's naked? And that's why Morley brought those kids there. They're, they're young people. They're, you know, children. And they're saying, no, like, yeah, they could do better than that. The emperor's new clothes. The emperor is mm, butterball naked. Butterball naked. Okay. So, we're going to hear some more art speak. Here we go. It has this multiplicity of potential meanings. It doesn't mean any one of them. It may not mean a thing. But could not have said it better myself. At $170,000. You sure now? $170,000. $170,000. The hammer's down on the last lot. The end of a successful evening. Yes, we were extremely pleased with the sale. Total sales, $20,264,750. And until the checks come in, the treasures wait in Sotheby's storeroom. It is, in a way... Sotheby's. Okay. A little like your basement. The bits and pieces of a lifetime. Is that ladder for climbing? Or is it for appreciating? And that faucet, we all... What the hell? Why did he focus on the ladder? Mmm. 
Let me tell you one thing. There's a lot of ladders in The Shining. <laughs> Especially in the beginning, like on closing day of the hotel. Mmm. Ay, ay, ay. What's going on? What's going on? What's going on? Anyway, let's keep it moving all the way to the end. One of those, it's surely a neglected bit of plumbing at Sotheby's. But no, it's a genuine Jan Dibbets, bid up to $7,500. A bargain or junk soon to be consigned to the trash heap of art history. And Hilton Kramer hand, is certain. Many of these artists, uh, as I well know, live in great dread of waking up one morning and finding that it's all disappeared, that somebody blew the whistle and they're no longer going to be considered important. That all the vacuum cleaner does is pick up dirt. All the vacuum cleaner does is pick up dirt. And um, with the day Coons's vacuum cleaner goes back to being a vacuum cleaner, then the curtain comes down. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that's that. All the vacuum cleaner can do is pick up dirt. These artists, according to Hilton Kramer, and he says he knows this for a fact, they're terrified of everybody discovering that this is all a complete and colossal sham. I don't think they're worried about their art careers. They're worried about something else. That's my opinion. That's my opinion. So, you all, um, I hope I did an okay job. I hope this thing takes. I hope that my little program here caught the computer audio for this, um, what we're looking at here, the 60 minutes segment. Yes, but is it art? I'll go back to the first uh, part of it. Yes, but is it art? Produced by this person, right? And we have an image of shop vac of all things um once again cbs 60 minutes whoever i am not trying to pass this work off as my own i did my commentary uh i'm promoting this i'm doing this for an educational purpose yes i might use this in an educational setting so please don't don't come for me be kind to me um and I've said, you know, what I, what I had to say, uh, as the, as the thing was rolling. It took me long enough. We're on 52 minutes right now. I, you know, I, th I think I've, I've said my piece in my own way reacting to this. Never done a reaction video before. Of course it took me an hour. Of course it did. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, anything less would be uncivilized, wouldn't it? So, you guys, <clears throat> excuse me, let me know in the comments what you think did i do a good job do you agree with me or disagree with me do you agree with morley or disagree with morley do you agree with jeff or disagree with jeff or whoever like or any of the people in the featured in this video um i tried my best let me know what you think i can't wait for the comments by the way i love seeing what people have to say and i guess that's that for this video i'm going to reiterate you know, uh, new viewers, thank you for being new. Returning viewers, thank you for returning. Subscribers, thank you so much for subscribing. Every single last one of you, please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share. If anybody you know might be interested in any of my nonsense, um, please pass it on, you know. Um, again, working diligently. Spent a good number of hours working on the Shining video tonight. Not quite there yet. Tomorrow hopefully and if i don't do it tomorrow it'll be the day after tomorrow i'll come up with some other video tomorrow i promise i don't think i'll do a follow-up to this who knows i hope they don't copyright strike me good lord jesus i hope they don't copyright right strike me <sighs> pray for me y'all pazuzu be with me anyway is that all i have to say is that all i have to say i don't know i don't know what thumbnail i'm going to use for this damn thing um <laughs> I I just don't know. I don't know if, if it's going to be a vacuum cleaner or basketballs or a puppy. The puppy was adorable. Maybe I'll use that for the thumbnail <laughs> for this video. You guys, uh, once again, thank you so much for watching. I appreciate it like you wouldn't believe. 
I can't wait for the comments. Uh, and that's it for now. That's it for tonight. So until next time, until I find yet another reason to talk at you, hopefully it's going to be The Shining, fingers crossed. Uh, until then, I will go ahead and bid you bye-bye. So bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>